So first of all, let me thank you very much for the opportunity here to give a presentation about the 3D networks here, even on, in the online mode, because I'm really sorry this morning I had a PhD defense and therefore I cannot travel down to, to Munich here. So thanks again for this opportunity to give this presentation here. So the title of the presentation and the next 20 minutes, I like to talk about it a little bit again. And we heard these kind of a buzzwords already in some other presentation here. It's about the 3D networks and the 6G takes off in order to really tackle this 3D network. So once again, my name is uh, Armin Dikosi. I'm with the University of Bremen. I'm the head of the Department of Communication Engineering, as well as the executive director of the just recently founded Gauss-Alba Space Technology Transfer Center, where we really like to transfer our results we develop in the department really to the industry in terms of very close collaborations. Okay, so let me switch to the next slide. Yeah, okay, works. So once again, the title is 6G, a unified 3D network. So you see already that I bring in here a term which is already also quite often mentioned, unified 3D network. But if you go one step back in order to motivate the unification is really when you go for the 5G non-terrestrial network, right? It was some kind of a step-by-step -step integration of these flying objects. The flying objects are the low attitude platforms, the high ones, the satellite, the geos, whatever, everything which is flying. So it was a kind of a step-by-step -step integration we follow there. And it was based actually really on a design which is poorly for terrestrial components. It was at the end of the day, the release 15, right? Which was fixed then and then for sure onwards, the other releases 17, 18, etc. But at the end of the day, it was really a step-by-step -step integration. With the 6G, we try to come up with a different kind of approach in order to design a network. And the network we are really focusing here on is to have a unified terrestrial aerospace network, which we call a 3D network. That means the key idea behind we are following is actually to come up with a holistic design approach where we have terrestrial aerospace components which define the network or more precisely its architecture and contribute really with their to the information processing given the individual specific attributes of the components. And the specific attributes of these components, right, are, for example, we have different attributes, different coverage from local to global, simply saying. We have different latencies, latencies below milliseconds or up to 120 milliseconds, et cetera. So then we have the different data rates, we have different link budgets. But one thing I really like to express here and stress is do we, that we have really very diverse processing capabilities. And our main objective should be to come up really with a holistic design where we try to bring all these quite all these kind of quite diverse attributes together in order to, for example, deliver the services as required, simply saying. So it's not worth to discuss about latencies of Leos, etc., which are maybe too long or too short. No. It's really the way that we should come up with a unified network where we try to combine all these kind of diverse attributes, right, in order to increase the performance compared, for example, to a step-by-step -step integration of 5G. So diversity in terms of these attributes shown here, right, from a communication perspective especially counts. Right. It's not anymore if it's a terrestrial or a, a aerospace component. No, let's focus on this combination of these attributes in the best kind of a way here. And that brings me a little bit to some key features here we can address here. For example, in this, what I like to show later, the Open 6 up here, which is funded by the German Ministry of Education Research, we go for ideas of flexible relocation of network functionalities, the core and the RAN, right? This brings up the best words like organic networking, or we can address much more flexible in a way dynamic functional splitting between terrestrial links and aerospace links, simply saying. Furthermore, I guess specifically because of this network really set up, we can much go further to distribute it by joint processing, especially for example, beamforming or information flow processing in such networks. I will a little bit capture that later on in some more detailed investigations we already have done here. And I guess everybody agrees with me here in the audience here that in future communication systems, there will be machine learning in. 
That means we can go for distributed machine learning concepts, right? Machine learning for communication and communication for machine learning, both is required. And for example, one quite, let me say, promising learning concept is, for example, federated learning. And the end of the day, we have these kind of diverse attributes of the diverse, let me say, network components, but we have to link them together in order to have, at the end of the day, a network design here. And that brings in exactly this very important topic of inter-device links, especially for the satellites we are discussing already intensively, the inter-satellite links, right? But this offers exactly the possibility of aero orbital edge computing, as we have already heard today. We might have then less gateway stations in order to deliver maybe some data collected at with the satellites down to the ground stations, etc. We can, for example, have fast backhauling for financial issues and applications, as well as these networks allow us really to to come up with good load balancing concepts, maybe more broader intensively as we have done it in the past. And but there are much more, more features to be listed here. This is just an abstract of some of the key features here. So now let me come a little bit to the research activities we already started in the in, in, in Bremen here. And the first thing I like to show you today is we 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 are, have a quite good footprint. Meanwhile, in the in the 6G program of the German Ministry of Education and Research, so it's, we are leading a work package exactly on this 3D network in the so-called Open 6 job. It's one of the four 6 job funded here, right? We are also partner for the 3D networks, right, in the 6G platform, which brings together all the stakeholders of this program together in order to start consolidation processes to discuss the technology, coming up with harmonization aspects and address that in order to be prepared later on with the industry to, to really have a good, let me say, contribution to the 3 dpp standardization, because that at the end counts, right? And therefore, there will be also in the future, I guess there is, I can already tell you, there will be a 6G industrial project showing up in the third pillar of this BMBF program here, where exactly the key, the key aspect is the 3G, 3D networks in this unifying kind of approach here. And there will be a key industry player exactly cooperating also with the University of Bremen to do the transfer from the hubs, right? to the industrial project and linked together within the 6G platform. But also on the ESA level here, we already have some projects. Uh, Mr. Bench already announced one, right, which will be also the green flag is already quite nice waving here that it will be announced quite, quite soon that we have this project here. It's again on, for example, machine learning and satellites, etc. We also partner in Satnex here, as well as we have a specific program set up at the University of Bremen in strong collaboration with Alborg University, where we address exactly also the, the satellite uh, constellation stuff here, especially federated learning. But it's not just about all these kind of theoretical kind of investigations we do, especially in the Open 6 job, we have so-called open labs here. And the open labs in Bremen is that we have here an outdoor experiment field where we really like to to, to set up the whole a network consisting of drones, airplanes, as well as satellites. So we have already some cooperation with satellite um, uh, uh, operators, etc., in order to link it exactly to this experiment field here. So you see, it's already also that we have to go to the tax beds in order to transfer our results uh, to the industry. And it's an open lab, and this open lab means industry partners as well as research partners are highly welcome to participate right with their own equipment for example uh, to to perform in a collaborative way the research and development of 3d networks on this open lab in these open labs here so this is a little bit the program we are meanwhile set up here where the university of bremen is is in there now let me come to some first results. I just picked up three of them in order to show you what we have done in the last year, more or less, right? Leveraging the expertise we already ramped up in the few years before on yeah, mobile communication as well as satellite communication. And one big topic, I guess, is, is exactly for sure, it was also mentioned somewhere on the slides, and we are at the University of Bremen are experts in the, say, baseband processing, it's the Leo Constellation downlink beamforming. And when we started once these ideas, well, how to beamform here using mega constellations, right? The key questions we were actually asking, is it possible by simply 
using a very simple transmit receive beamforming concept to really come close to the capacity of a MIMO system simply thing. So that means you see here we set up some, some constellations here, right? Maybe of a few satellites here. We have uniform linear arrays here at each satellite, and each satellite transmits its information to a ground station, and the ground station uh, uh, performs multi-satellite receive beamforming based on a max SNR approach here. So it's a very complex thing because we can fully exploit let me say the geometric information where the satellites are. So we only require channel state information in terms of angle of arrival and angle of departure, as well as we are simply performing linear processing here. And the results we can show meanwhile by some investigations is that, and that's the key parameter, is the intersatellite distance here is sufficiently large. We can really show that the sum rate is close to the capacity. That means with this little simple approaches quite nothing new at the end of the day right we can show that this when we go for the layer downing beam forming across different satellites or so distributed processing is showing up somehow here we can come close very close to the capacity and that's shown here right for example you see uh, the blue line is exactly the capacity and this orange line is exactly the very simple beamforming approach we have followed here. And you see when the intersatellite distance is rather small, 10 kilometers, there is some gap here. But as soon as the intersatellite distance is larger here, exactly for 70 kilometers here, just an example, you see there is no gap anymore visible between the really the so-called capacity, which is the MIMO SVD capacity here, right, compared to the sum rate, which is exactly achieved by this simple linear processing scheme here. And then we ask the question, is it really how many satellites should we have at the end of the day to gain some performance, right, in terms of the sum rate of these capacity bits per second per hertz, simply say. And you see here, it's not, not always the case that more satellites help. You see, especially when the intersatellite distance is too short, one satellite is superior compared to have more satellites. Right. This is just because of the high interference when you're closer to these kind of channel matrix and investigate, you will see that this loss is just simply said by the higher satellite interference when they are too close to each other, simply saying. But as soon as the intersatellite distance is large enough, then you see you can gain something when you increase the number of satellites, the larger the number of satellites here, we go up to six, the larger at the end of the day the sum rate, right? which is quite obvious from a poor intuitive perspective. But you see, it's not, there is some kind of a crossover point one has to be aware of. So this is, gives us some indication that especially, and that's the key message here, with simple beam forming distributed across these satellites here, uniform linear arrays, nothing spectacular used here. We really come close to the capacity, right, when the intersatellite distance is large enough. And we already published this in some publications listed here at the bottom. Another kind of a topic I mentioned is learning, right? So we asked once the question, uh, federated learning is a quite promising approach here in learning, right? Because you, you share not the data, you share just the, the parameters you learn somehow, right? That means the, the data itself keeps private, right? It's very highly investigated, meanwhile, in mobile communication terrestrial scenarios. So can we use it also for learning approaches in Leo constellations? For sure we can use, but maybe it needs to be adapted to specific properties of the satellite constellations. And some of the specific properties were, we do have long offline times, right? That means if you look, for example, to a ground station in Bremen and you have five shells here, we analyzed here Walker star constellation diagrams. You see here uh, the, the, the red, the red time slots here are when you have the, the connections to the ground station, while the other ones here, the highlight in blue here, it's offline mode. That means we have long offline times. Compared to the federated learning uh, applied to mobile communications on terrestrial components, we are users are the clients. We have just a few satellites, so we have to deal around with less clients here. And the most important aspect actually, which helps us to come up with cool algorithms in terms of federated learning in Leo constellation that we know the position at which time the satellites are. That means we can fully exploit the deterministic spatial temporal movements of the satellites. 
And the objective we are following from the design perspective of the learning is the fast convergence, but we modified with respect to these special properties, the algorithms. More, price, more precisely, if you're familiar with these algorithms, we updated the global parameter updates, right, that, uh, that the server is doing here, the ground station, for example, and we modified specifically the scheduling in terms of learning and time and updates time. That means when do the server transmit its information to the clients and vice versa. So we have to tailor communication protocols. And there, what, we, what comes into the game is, do we have inter-satellite links, yes or no? And here are just some results. You see here, this purple line is simply the classical federated averaging learning algorithms intensively used, for example, for terrestrial learning, right? But because of this long offline time, you see here, we have long, long, uh, let me say, um, um, convergence, very small, less convergence rate here. That means it requires many, many time in order to get some kind of an accuracy in terms of learning. Then we modified it, exactly this, these algorithms and the scheduling to take into consideration the spectral property, the special properties here, right? With, with this call, we call this algorithm FETSAT, right? And see, we, we gain something here, right? In terms of accuracy and convergence. But the funny thing at the end of the day, and this is maybe also uh, some takeaway here, is you can use the federal averaging learning algorithms, really, once again, the classical one used for big data and on terrestrial communication settings here, right? Because it brings in a huge performance gain when we have intersatellite links. So again, here, the same story as quite often here, intersatellite links tremendously help also in terms of, let me say, the federated learning here when we apply to LEO, LEO constellations here. So this is maybe one key takeaway also with that really this kind of progress in terms of having good intersatellite links helps in many, many sense here. Also here in the sense of applying federated learning in LEO constellations. And finally, the last slide I like to show here is another topic and some of the previous speaker already mentioned the information flow design in this future unified network, which we call a 3D network here. And there has been done quite intensive research in the past to a little bit address this perspective more from an overall information theoretical kind of approach here. And this is approach here is called information bottleneck approach. It's a kind of a probabilistic approach here. So what do I mean with that? And I like to show you two examples. It's just two examples of information flows here we can have in mind when we discuss exactly to have this unified network. For sure, again here, we started with this investigation on the LEO constellations, et cetera, but for sure drones and all the other flying objects can be also part here in this kind of a story. So assume, for example, you have here some multiple users here, right, which are connected here to a relay node, and this relay node transmit any the information here, the fused one to a satellite, for example. So you have a classical processing chain here, which we describe probabilistically here, right? And now the key thing is actually this, this, this link here, right, is maybe rather rate limited and error prone here. And the key question is now, how should we design the processing on this relay node? That means exactly on this relay node here, in order to take into consideration the rate limitation to the satellite, as well as that there is an error prone communication ongoing here. But in which sense we like to design this kind of processing? And the sense is exactly brings in this information bottleneck approach that we really like to maximize the end to end information rate. That means really from here, up to here, or simply saying from all the users here up to the satellite, right? That's our main objective. And this is exactly what uh, IB is doing, information bottleneck. And this is sometimes also called from the information theoretical community here, the joint source and channel coding problem, because we include already the errorness, the error statistics of this uplink here to the satellite in the design of the processing here at the relay node. And we analyzed this kind of framework and developed algorithms in order to deal around with it, especially that we have here a processing, right, where once again, there's no explicit channel coding anymore required here. It's already included in the calculation of this processing here. And the algorithm in doing is called your vector aware, uh, forward aware vector IB, 
when you, you see uh, some results, right? Assume, for example, you simply perform some quantization on this relay node compression, simply saying, right? And you use the rate distortion theory, right? Uh, space, for example, on the Lloyd Max algorithm. And if you have a quite high uh, error probability of the uplink, you see there is no convergence at all. Then you can go and say, let me try to use the information bottleneck method, but without taking into consideration here the error characteristic of this uplink channel here, right? Then you see you gain something, there's a convergence, right? But if you really take into consideration and perform really joint source and channel coding, you can see uh, some gain here, which is about a 1.2 dB as an example, right? And for sure, is the uh, error probability diminish then this this performance getting better and better and the, the the different concepts are more and more closely uh, closely related to each other but keep one thing in mind it's really this information bottleneck like used to come up with a joint source and channel coding design here for this relay node so this is one example of the information flow there's another one uh, which I like finally to, to to mention here without showing the results assume for example you have a single user right, and it transmits to several satellites, right, so you have here now multiple satellites, okay, and this is exactly the uplink to the satellites, and then you have again here some kind of a downlink transmission, for example, to a ground station here, and the key thing is now how should this satellite here, right, perform a joint but distributed processing in order to maybe perform a joint source and channel coding together to make exactly again here the same story that this max that this end-to-end -end information rate here is maximized from here up to here. So we really design algorithms of joint processing, but distributed on the satellites. But the key thing in the design we take into consideration again the error characteristic of these channels here. As well as, and that's one of the key results I like finally to mention, we do not require at the end of the day inter-satellite links. Okay, so that's important. It's a joint design following exactly this objective to maximize the end-to-end -end information flow, right? But without any kind of inter-satellite links because it's not required. So we can extend it from one up to n satellites here, right? And it depends for sure on how many satellites, for example, use or see at some time, et cetera. And what we do next is we lay the foundation by all this kind of mass behind. But again, bringing back to these projects, we have also these industrial projects where we are partners. We like to further develop these ideas in order to bring practical constraint into, right, as and then show that maybe it's a good approach here, motivated by information theoretical aspects, which helps us in order to design information flow in the 3D networks. And once again, it's just here shown for satellites, right? But for sure, also the drones with its specific capabilities, as well as the airplanes, are also part of the whole story. It's a framework we laid so far, and it's already published in many publications. So you see, we already started to work on the 3D networks in the Open6 job. These are the results, and the next step is really now to step by step further mature them in order to transfer them to the industry in collaborative projects as shown before as well as to perform testing on that by implementing it in testbed. This ends up my little presentation here once again thanks for having this opportunity also we are online mode here to present some of the ideas we're doing and the projects we are in there what is meant by 3D networks this unified approach. Thanks a lot any, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you.